let's let's just keep going through that track you know the 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 track of development so mm -hmm. your late teens um your clearing of high school mm -hmm. uh you're going getting into college what are what are those years going to look like for you yeah mm -hmm. so i finally kind of late well, mid to late teens mm -hmm. um, in what we call in Scotland fifth and sixth year of mm -hmm. school. So I would have been about 16, 17. Um, I finally made some good friends in school and felt like I had a sense of um, kind of my, my people there, as it were. Mm. Um, and I think partly that was just everybody being a bit more mature and recognizing that everybody's different. And, and yeah, mm. um, church continued to be a big part and, and faith continued to be a big part of my life. Family continued to be a huge part of my life and wider family as well now that we were in Scotland closer to cousins and aunts and uncles and, mm. and all of that um, I began to work at the age of 15 um, mm -hmm. in the UK um, I think particularly for our generation it, it was fairly normal for 15 kids. was a very big year you mentioned it quite <laughs> yeah I guess <laughs> maybe it's a rough approximation of a number of, <laughs> but I, I remember starting to work a few months before my 16th birthday yeah um, and my first job mm -hmm. was um, as a receptionist in an opticians because my Aha. career aspiration at that point was to become an optician all right um i knew i wanted to be in a role that would serve other people mm -hmm. um i wanted to do something that would impact people's lives mm -hmm. i was worried being a doctor would be too much hard work <laughs> <laughs> and that i might not get the grades uh -huh. so i had convinced myself that optometry was like the, yeah, the, the closest best. thing yeah mm. <laughs> Um, and so um, I, I got a job in opticians, worked as a receptionist um, until about second year of uni. So it was mm. like a, a Saturday, I used to do I think a Saturday and one other shift during mm. the week, um, usually kind of after school. Mm -hmm. um, and working from an early age taught me a huge amount about work ethic, mm -hmm. about responsibility, about establishing kind of trust and respect and, and building mm. those kind of relationships at work. Um, and even just financial literacy. Yeah. Um, I have an income, yeah. I'm expected to pay some things mm. at home, mm. I'm expected to save for, some things for yeah, school, for yeah. university. Sure. Um, and those are hugely important life lessons mm -hmm. that I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, and yeah, so I, I worked there until second year of university. I applied to study optometry and I remember, actually, I was visiting Belfast and I got my final year of school exam results and I qualified to go do optometry. Mm. Um, and I got this confirmation of the exam results. Should have been the happiest thing in the world, but mm. instead, what I remember is standing in a phone box at that time, because it was still before <laughs> mobile, mobile phones, yeah. uh, and standing in this phone box, putting my coins in the phone, uh, and calling home to say, actually, I don't want to do optometry. <laughs> I want to do something else, but I don't know what. Mm. Um, and over the next few weeks, um, with parents, with friends, with, with others, um, exploring options, and ended up um, signing up to do a Bachelor of Divinity. Oh, wow. <laughs> so my undergraduate degree is divinity. Oh, that was uh, a, quite a shift. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> From optometry mm. to... Uh, and it's interesting because even as I was studying, mm -hmm. um, most of... So this, at that point, there was still this kind of perception that if you were a male studying um, divinity, you would go and be a pastor. And if mm -hmm. you were a female, you would go and be a teacher of religious education. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do either of those things. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we'd never been raised to say, OK, this is a woman's job and this is a man's job. Mm. And uh, for those to be barriers, our parents mm. were very open. Mm. But even if being a pastor was an opportunity, it didn't to me sit like this is where mm. I'm headed. Mm. Um, and, and really all the way through my degree, um, I didn't have clarity as to where it's headed. I didn't want to teach. Um, my mom was a teacher. Um, I, I don't think that's what put me off specifically but I just did not want to teach I didn't want to be a pastor in the traditional sense of kind of having a church and mm. um uh, and yeah so I had many questions about where I was headed but I loved university um the faculty was relatively small compared to some of the others and mm. um, not many people want to study divinity mm. <laughs> um and it was just it was intimate it was a great community um, had some amazing lecturers, very intentionally chose to study at a secular university mm -hmm. rather than kind of Bible college mm. <laughs> um, because I wanted a broader experience. Mm. Um, 
and and yeah it was absolutely the right decision mm. um and loved it mm -hmm. so so mm. yeah um, i jumped Fan ahead to university here fantastic <laughs> fantastic yeah. fantastic mm. and how long did that course take you it's four years mm -hmm. um so the way university degrees in scotland work you do three years for a basic bachelor's or four mm. years means you get bachelor's with honors mm. so that's mm. what i did mm. bachelor degree mm. with honors mm. um and through that time is when i did my first visit to kenya okay. as well okay um so, all right um, I guess after that first trip when I was 14 to Moldova, yeah, I had this ongoing interest in, in what, as I say, all of these questions around what it means to show up for people elsewhere. In, in a different community, in a different context. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So That's in, not necessarily your own. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And understanding those different contexts yeah. and figuring out what my place is potentially there and whether I even have a place. Yeah. Was the first trip to Kenya um, a community based school project or was it not was, really uh -huh. um so after my trip when i was 14 mm -hmm. um i ended up on another trip to romania mm -hmm. um and i think even again at that this one was about 15 16 began to sense there has to be a caution around the, how those kind of trips are are conducted mm -hmm. but at that young age really not figuring out what that was mm -hmm. When I was in my final year of high school, I actually organized a trip ah. for, um, there was five of us who went to Romania again mm -hmm. um, and did some work in the orphanages there, which at the time were a big piece. There was this whole um, kind of legacy in, in Romania from mm. Ceausescu's um, leadership that had left all of these children mm. hugely neglected in mm -hmm. orphanages. Mm. Um, and we went for a couple of weeks Yes, we did good work when we were there. Did we really solve part of a bigger problem? Mm. No. And mm, mm. <laughs> um, did it potentially cost our hosts more to host us than the benefit we oh. brought as five young kids? Mm. Possibly. Mm. A, a lot of the dysfunction of, of that mm. kind of mm. um, international mission mm. trips, I, I think, began to come mm. to light. Mm. Um, and around that time, it was mm -hmm. 98, um, mm -hmm. my grandparents moved to Kenya. Uh -huh. So it was the same year I started university. Mm. So they moved to run um, Thomas Bernardo's house mm -hmm. on the invitation of um, Balcraig Foundation, mm -hmm. which have run the, the children's home for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And they were living here. They were running the children's home, mm -hmm. dealing with a whole host of issues, everything mm -hmm. from kind of corruption within the home to figuring out what is a good children's home mm. or orphanage if such a thing exists. Mm. Now I don't believe that it does, mm. Mm. <laughs> if such a thing exists. Mm. Uh, they were in their retirement. Mm -hmm. um, my gran had been a nurse by profession, my mm. grandfather a pastor. Mm. Um, so again, kind of this fit of, are these the skill sets that mm -hmm. are needed? Mm. What does this look like? Mm. Um, uh, and so uh, as a student, mm -hmm. the first thing that came to my mind was great, I have free accommodation in Nairobi. Mm. <laughs> All I need is a plane ticket and I yeah, can go hang out and yeah, figure out what Nairobi yeah, is like. Yeah. And so that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So I came um, came to volunteer, but was staying with my grandparents um, within the children's home because they lived on site. So this is a solo trip. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But my grandparents were here. So sure. it was kind of, it was a very safe option. Yeah. yeah. Um, but fell in love mm. with the place, mm. um, with the people I met, mm. with just, Mm. Yeah, and, mm. and so I came back. Mm. Um, I managed to, because I, I was still employed, so I, I worked um, in the opticians I said to about second year of university. Then I was actually a, a waitress in a bar mm. for the next two, three years. Mm. Um, and somehow managed to juggle with my employers that I could take like two months, three months off at a time mm. um, and come do these trips and mm. then go back when mm. class was going back at university. And, mm. and so did that for a couple of years back mm. and forth. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, it was an amazing way to begin to understand a place and people and mm. figure out some of the cultural pieces, mm. begin to a bit more deeply ask these questions mm. about um, children's homes and mm -hmm. orphanages, but also about this kind of international development perspective. So, yeah. Um, and interestingly, mm -hmm. international development mm. was like a brand new concept to me. Yeah. Like it was never through school presented as mm. like, this is a career option. Mm. This mm. is a, a pathway you can follow. Like mm. it, no one had ever put in front of us. Mm. International development mm. is is a thing. Mm. <laughs> so what are the things that are standing out at that time I, in, mm. in this in this back back and mm. forth trips? Uh, what what are highlights that are arising for you in that in that 98 2000 period? 
again, people, I guess I'm a people person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so particularly the older um, teens, so essentially my age mates yeah. from within that Bernardo's Rocket. community, who yeah. some of whom I still count as, as great friends today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but sitting with them and, and, and just through friendship, mm -hmm. beginning to hear their experience, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. understand the, the dynamic that, that actually orphanages typically don't take care of orphans, mm. <laughs> but they take care of children who have families um, who unfortunately, for one reason or another, mm. um, have faced barriers in raising their own children. Mm. And again, that kind of came back full circle about 10 years later when we did some very intentional work at Vision Africa mm. around deinstitutionalization. Mm. Um, and it, it work that the research that has been done in the region shows that about 80 percent of children in children's homes actually have families mm. um, and the best way to help those children is to help their families <laughs> yeah but we've inherited mm. this model of child mm. protection that mm. is removing children from families mm. um, and is hugely unhealthy mm. and so i think that whilst i didn't understand all of the kind of dynamics of how and why that mm. began to become apparent through mm. those friendships mm. with, with those older mm. teens. Mm. Um, it's, it's sort of like research that you're doing yeah. without calling yeah. it research. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think because I was studying divinity at the same time, mm. so my um, focus in divinity was on practical theology. Mm. Mm. Um, so trying to understand this kind of theology piece how it fits alongside in my mind what was a missions piece mm. my coming to kenya in my mind was was missions, missions. so how does that right. fit with, with missions how do yeah. we do that well then this other piece of the the community i've grown up in in glasgow the mm. church community and and working amidst that deprivation and poverty in the uk mm. and figuring out how all of those pieces fit together mm. i remember having an argument with one of my friends from high school. Um, mm. We were both at university doing separate courses and um, sitting reflecting on my visit to Kenya, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and just, I remember saying to her, but there are children in Glasgow who don't go to school because they don't have shoes. Mm. And it's the same as <laughs> different reasons and different kind of dynamics around why they do or don't have shoes. Mm. But that poverty, that deprivation. And, and to be honest, I think that was my beginning of understanding of justice mm. and, and injustice sadly mm. 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 <laughs> um, and beginning to probe the differences between charity and justice yeah the differences between what churches often call missions mm. and, and development mm. um, and how international mm. development organizations kind of plug into that mm. whole discourse mm. um, so it's still very green still mm. pretty naive mm. but but mm. trying to negotiate all mm. that mm. and I was aware that I was um, even whilst volunteering mm. um, a white person mm -hmm. and that, that brought certain dynamics yeah. to how the, I was the received whole and how I was yeah. responded to yeah, and yeah. it offered me in some circumstances huge privilege that I felt came very undeserved and, yeah. and I, I struggled to know what to do with that and mm. how to process that mm, mm. Um, particularly wanting to be polite and British at the same time <laughs> 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 um, so so yeah I'm um, beginning to be aware of that and, and learning mm -hmm. probably for the first time in a deep way mm. about colonialism mm -hmm. and that legacy as well mm. Um, mm. which I don't remember being taught in school mm. and to any huge extent anyway mm. Mm. I think I was aware it had existed but, mm. it, but yeah I, I definitely wasn't taught from the perspective of anybody who had been colonized right. um, and and so yeah beginning to be aware of that legacy and whether I liked it or not yeah. that I carried that legacy in some way simply yeah. by the color of my yeah. skin and, and the origin of, of where I come from so a lot of a lot of uh, consciousness is arising mm -hmm. on, on, on very crucial mm -hmm. aspects, mm -hmm. uh, cr crucial aspects about social justice, mm -hmm. uh, crucial aspects about power dynamics, crucial aspects about a community, um, of, of the community that you're beginning to fall in love with, um, uh, and, and how integration can happen with all these dynamics that, mm -hmm. uh, that and now, you know, all these dynamics vis-a-vis -vis also what you're uh, learning in school and what education and um, and exposure that you have vis-a-vis -vis also what uh, people and their people centricity and human centricity mm -hmm. are, are bringing into the fore. And this is at, at a time when you're probably in your 
early 20s yeah late teens late very teens, early 20s uh, yeah so a yeah. lot of all of that is mm -hmm. coming together mm -hmm. in your trips mm -hmm. you have a you have a home that you know your grandparents home you have a bit of income that you're earning from, from, from jobs that when you go back to school that you're doing all of that is the situation that you are in mm -hmm. at this time mm -hmm. um and and trips to and fro yeah. uh I, i'm loving that particular scenario i'm i'm, I'm picturing <laughs> you <laughs> at, at that time so yeah.